God's grace and His mercy and His peace be with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right, so we did the suffering servant songs. Weren't those great that the Lord would say so much to us uh, in Isaiah about the Father and the Son and what the Father was thinking, what the Son was thinking, and how the Father was encouraging His Son in those passages that we're speaking about really what their thoughts and the relationship were going to be like as they went through their work to save us from our sins and give us eternal life. So we looked at each of those servant songs, and uh, that was so beautiful. So thanks for being a part of that. And then last week, Holy Week, and we are uh, celebrating, of course, as we always do, the Lord's resurrection. Uh, and so today I thought we could do just for this week and maybe one other week possibly, Look at the resurrection in the Old Testament before we jump into our next major study, probably a letter in the New Testament. But uh, I thought since we're on resurrection, let's talk about the resurrection. And could you actually, uh, if you were talking with a Jew who is not a Christian, could you argue with them from the Hebrew scriptures, from the Old Testament, that Jesus was to be raised from the dead and that there is a resurrection. You know, most Jews don't believe that. The Pharisees did in Jesus' day and Paul knew that. Paul was one of them. But uh, could you argue from the Old Testament on the resurrection of the Christ and the resurrection of people in general? Let's take a look at that tonight and see what we can learn on this beautiful topic. I think it's great for us to spend a few weeks just focusing on the resurrection because the more we hear of it, the more we believe it and believing it, this is the gospel in which you're saved, by which you stand, if you hold it fast, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. So fantastic. Let's take a look here. And let's start there in 1 Corinthians 15. You can either open up or just read along, uh, read along with me or just listen. So 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says... Now I would remind you, brethren, this is verse 1, in what terms I preached to you the gospel, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold it fast, unless you believed in vain. Notice the need to hold fast the gospel. Good thing you're in church, amen? Yeah, we don't want to be out just dilly-dallying and frolicking about in this world because you could, it could slip from your fingers. So you're in the right place. Let's refresh ourselves in it. For, he says, For I delivered to you as of First importance, most important, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and, he appeared, and that He appeared to Cephas, etc. So notice, you're right there, you see that Paul says Christ's death and His resurrection were according to the scriptures, and what scriptures is he talking about? The Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. So obviously Paul believes the Old Testament was foretelling that very thing, Christ's resurrection. Let's look at Acts 17, verses 1 and following. All right. We're going to read verses 1 through about 5. Now, when they when they'd passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and for three weeks he argued with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ, etc. So notice, he went into the synagogues, as his custom usually was, and he's argued with them from the scriptures that the Christ was supposed to die and to rise from the dead. Could you do that? I mean, he knew the scriptures very well. What, what scriptures was he using? Let's look at one more here. Let's look at Acts 3, huh? I said I wish it could have been there. Yeah, fly on the wall there with Paul preaching, huh? That would be great. Three weeks he preached on that, too. All right, so Acts chapter 3, verse 17. This is uh, Peter and John. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did 
also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that, the Christ, that his Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for establishing all that God spoke by the mouth of a, the whole, his holy prophets from of old. All right. All right. God having raised up his servant, he's taught, okay, so, all right, I'll read the rest of this. Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, etc. Whom heaven must receive, etc. Okay, verse 22. Moses said, and he quotes here Deuteronomy 18. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren as he raised me up. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came afterwards also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God gave to your fathers, saying to Abraham, and your posterity shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you in turning every one of you from your wickedness. So Peter is there using actually Deuteronomy chapter 18, saying that God's going to raise up for you a prophet. And actually he did raise up Jesus Christ, not only to be a man to preach, but also raised him up from the dead. And that everybody's to believe and listen to and obey that prophet. And if you don't do so, God will require it of you. And that's Jesus. So that's Peter preaching. Paul was preaching it. And who else do you think referenced the fact that Christ was predicted to have been raised from the dead in the Old Testament? Well, we did Peter. We got Paul. John probably did. I don't know it in the New Testament, though. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus said it. Okay, good answer. Luke 24, I'll read it from here. <laughs> he, he's just trying to be so, you know, he's trying to get special points. <laughs> then he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So who preaches the resurrection in the Old Testament? You've got Paul, you've got Peter, and you've got Jesus. But we don't know exactly what he said because you know, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, but man, what did you say? It would be so great if we had more of that. Even better than waiting for Paul, we could listen to Jesus open their minds. But let's take a look first at the references made by Jesus himself in other parts of the New Testament concerning the resurrection of the dead. Okay, let's take a look here, for example, at Matthew 22, uh, verse 23. Let's open up and I'll read there for you. Mm-hmm. Matthew 22, 23, and I'll read it and you can see if Jesus speaks of the resurrection. We're going to start actually 23. Yeah. 23. 23, verse Matthew 22, verse 23. Okay. The same day Sadducees came to him, to Jesus, who say that there is no resurrection. So Pharisees in those days believed in that, and they believed in angels. Sadducees, no, there's no angels, there's no resurrection. So they're the liberals, the Sadducees, the Pharisees are the conservatives. Both were wrong. But you got the libs and the conservatives even back then. This is the liberals talking to Jesus now. The Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died and having no children left his wife to left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, to which of the seven will she be wife? For they all had her. Can you see what jerks these people are, really? Because they're pretending as if they believe in the resurrection. 
But they don't believe in the resurrection. They're just trying to catch Jesus here. And, uh, you know, put a, put a question to him. Oh, well then, how can you decide which person the wife should be, uh, the woman should be wife to, since they, she had seven husbands, seven different brothers? That's, of course, we won't read the whole thing, but Deuteronomy 25. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her uh, to raise up seed for his brother. Okay. Interesting. Uh, we don't do that these days. But nevertheless, uh, it was part of uh, keeping the inheritance and the seed going in the family. All right, so the next of kin, the brother, was to do that for his, for his brother's wife if, he, if the first brother had passed away. All right, so how does Jesus answer this here? But Jesus answered them, you are wrong. Don't you love that about Jesus? You know, we're in such a mamsy, pamsy, um, scaredy cat kind of society where you just can't call out people anymore and you get a trip over your shoes just trying to appease everybody and not offend anyone. Jesus says, you're wrong. Just calls him out on it. And another, another one of the passages uh, says, is this not why you are wrong? And then he gives the reason. Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So his first charge is, you're wrong, number one, and it's because you don't know the scriptures, you don't understand them, you don't know the scriptures at all, so I'm challenging and charging you with that fault, and you don't know the power of God either. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? He's got them three times, right there in his opening sentence, salvo, baboom, a barrage from his turrets of his battleship here. Okay, and then he explains, he says, for in the resurrection... Notice he's saying that there is a resurrection. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? In other words, quoting the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard this, heard that he'd silenced the Sadducees, because, you know, they were against each other, conservatives and liberals, they came together and uh, they asked him a question, which is the greatest commandment, etc. Okay, so they kind of liked that he beat up on the liberals, <laughs> uh, the Sadducees, uh, but then he beats up on them next when they try to uh, give him a word and then he says, um, he gives them a question, we won't get into all that right now. But uh, he goes to the Old Testament there again. Okay, now, how does Jesus answer this here? First of all, you're wrong. You don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God. And then he says, in the resurrection, what is it like in, in, when you're married and then you go, what's it going to be like in the resurrection for Rich and Joy here? Or Ian and Jeannie, Greg and Beth, you guys, uh, what is it going to be like for you guys? Well, we neither marry nor are given a marriage, but we're like angels in heaven. We're equal to angels because we can't die anymore. That's interesting. Do you, does that touch you in a good way or a bad way? It depends probably on your marriage, right? <laughs> oh, good, I won't be married anymore. Or in another case, oh, I want to be married though. I love my spouse. Well, in, in each case, don't worry about it because number one, you're going to be reconciled up there if you're both Christians anyway. And number two, if you love your marriage here, do you think God has something less for you in the resurrection in the new world when you're raised from the dead that God's like, oh, I'm sorry, you had all the good stuff in the, that crappy, old, sinful, evil world and in my wonderful world I've prepared for you, it's, I'm sorry, we don't really have as good of a thing for you. It's not as good of a gig. Is that what he would say? Yeah. No, obviously the marriage that you have here, if it's great and it's always fraught with some friction since we're sinners and not perfect yet, um, it might be great. But you know what? In heaven, it's going to be so much the better than even the closest marriage could ever possibly be if it were even perfect. Because you're resurrected and you're going to know each other like you've never known each other before and a friendship like you've never had before and an intimacy of, of just communion that you've never had before. Maybe not the 
sexy communion that we have in this age, but a communion nevertheless of the most beautiful glory, far exceeding what you have right now to the point you're going to be like, that old thing of the, of the old earth, don't want it compared to the glory of this. This is far better. So you're going to have a better relationship with your spouse in heaven. All right. So that's good. Huh? What do you make about the angels who are actually above? Yeah, we're equal to angels in that we don't die anymore. So we're immortal. But we are actually above angels. Because that's Hebrews, what, 2? It says uh, the world to come was not given to angels, but to men. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Right now we're underneath angels because they're greater than we are in glory and strength. We're going to be above angels because, hey, who sits on God's throne? We sit on God's throne. Angels don't sit on God's throne. Man sits on God's throne. Jesus didn't become an angel when they sinned. Angels are unredeemable. God became a man and redeemed you. Think about that honor. And then is going to set you on his throne with him in the kingdom to come. So that's amazing. So you will be above angels, but you're going to be equal in terms of you can't die anymore. And uh, in heaven, by the way, we don't look down on other people like, I'm above you, <laughs> isn't that great? No. If we are in a higher position, it's, it's just a, it's all in a beautiful way of uh, humble service and love and mutual joy in each other. Us to angels, angels to us. But there are different orders and places, and we are seated on the throne in the kingdom to come. That's given to men which is an amazing honor. So be thankful you're born a human being and not an angel or an ant, you know, or a dolphin. You're, a, you're made in God's image. You're the only creature of all the creatures. You're made in his image and God has great things in store for you. Are they going to admit, hmm? uh, admit to us that they helped us in a particular situation? You think? Oh, pro probably. I don't know exactly, but I think... Uh, They'll be, you know, maybe get to heaven or maybe when we die in our last breaths, they'll be like, oh, hi, yeah, name's uh, Michael. Yeah, nice to meet you. I've been watching over you your whole life. Here, right this way. Let me carry you up to the Father. Now, I don't know how exactly it'll go, but won't that be amazing? There are angels here tonight. We just looked at 1 Corinthians 11. Remember the angels gather around the, the worship of the Christians and guard it. Thanks be to God, guarding us from all the evil spirits and the, the foul shadows that are about flying about Cape Canaveral tonight. They're Sending like probably silent sentinels, shining lights with, a, with a flaming swords all around this building tonight, guarding us from the evil one, that we can actually get the word. And they love the preaching of Jesus Christ. So, angels, thanks for being here. Okay, where were we though? But he's, that was only the first part of his answer. He describes what it's like in the resurrection. So he says, your question number one doesn't even apply because you're not going to have your marriage up there in heaven. So that's why you're wrong. You don't know the scriptures. You don't know the power of God. You're completely wrong. But now, let's prove to you, in more, so many words, Jesus says from the Old Testament that there is a resurrection. He says, As for the resurrection of the dead, which you guys don't believe, have you not read what was said to you by God? In other words, don't you read your Bible? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, but of the living. Great point. Where did Jesus say this, by the way? Here's our first one we can write down. Where does he say, I'm the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? At the burning bush. At the burning bush. So Exodus 3. Uh, burn, I'll just write burning bush here, but it's like, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, that proves the resurrection because he's not God of the dead people, but of the living. That's a good point. Good one. So, there is a resurrection. And he's saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive and will be resurrected as well. He didn't, well, he didn't say that. He said, uh, I know. Yeah. Oh, um, well, he's just, uh, he's not the God of dead people. He's not just God of people that are alive now, but he's, I mean, the people that have died in the faith are alive. That's his point, I think. Yeah. 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 So the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. He's not the God of dead people. I mean, of dead as in 
uh, destroyed and ceasing to exist, these people are alive. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So there's life after death. And I'm proving it to you in the resurrection, too, here by these passages. Let's look at another one. Uh, oh, that's the same. And that's the one over there in Exodus 3. And uh, by the way, in Exodus 3, God called to him from the bush, right? Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. But we read in verse 2, one verse you know, two verses previous, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. So notice, the angel of the Lord is in the bush and it calls to him, and who's calling to him? God calls to him out of the bush. So who is the angel of the Lord? God, Jesus. So Jesus is referring, he ought to know this passage refers to the resurrection. You know why? He's not just quoting the Bible and explaining it. Uh, he was there. <laughs> wouldn't it be great to be able to preach that way you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God and by the way I'm not only explaining these scriptures to you from 2,000 years ago but I really know this passage quite well because I was there <laughs> what that is so cool isn't it can you imagine if you could say such a thing goodness gracious that's awesome okay let's look you know, I don't have a lot of other references for Jesus' Old Testament references. Let's look, or do I? Uh, no, I do, I do, sorry. Let's look over at Matthew 12. That's going to take a couple weeks, actually. It's good. <laughs> Matthew 12, verse 38. We're just going to have fun because you know what? The longer you meditate on the resurrection, the better off we're going to be because there's nothing better than to, 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 to think on these things. Matthew, um, Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Notice once again, Jesus just does not play, uh, not, he plays nice, but he doesn't play softball. He's always hardball. He's, a, he's the king, remember? He just got rid of the Sadducees. Now he's getting rid of the Pharisees with a similar kind of way. You're an evil and adulterous generation since you're seeking for a sign, etc. But he says, but no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, this says whale, it should be great fish. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will arise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Etc. So he's there speaking about the resurrection to come, which is the judgment saying the men of Nineveh, who you think were terrible, worthless, idol, uh, idolater, devil worshipers, they're going to rise at the judgment and condemn you, who are so holy and self-righteous, thinking you're good with God when you're not. You're an adulterous and evil generation. No wonder they wanted to kill him, but he was speaking the truth. Nevertheless, what does Jesus refer to? As, as a sign of his resurrection, but it was an Old Testament resurrection. Jonah. So was Jonah really dead and come alive again? Well, I don't know. It seems like he was alive in the belly of the great fish, but being in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights was like a tomb. It was death. It would have been death. It's, I mean, who can live in such a thing? You know, when I preached on this some years ago on a, on a I think it was a Lenten service. We were doing a, a series through Jonah. And uh, that very week I was preaching on that passage, there happened to be a man that was swal swallowed by a whale off of South Africa. Wasn't it, you know? It was that week. I was like, what divine ordination appointment is this? That the very week I'm preaching on that, the man, he was swimming out in amongst of uh, mackerel or some schooling fish, and the whale just comes up, 
and just, and the man goes right into the fish, into into the whale, and he go and he starts to go down a little bit. He was in the whale's mouth, and the whale spit him out. And uh, he wasn't in three days and three nights, though. Three days and three nights is a miracle. So, how could he have survived? I don't know, but God is able to raise the dead. So, what's harder, to raise a dead person who's completely deceased, or raise Jonah who's mostly dead? It sounds like sounds like um, sounds like Princess Bride, right? Ah, he is only mostly dead. <laughs> no, <laughs> remember that show? <laughs> that was a great show, by the way. But yeah, I think Jonah was probably mostly dead, but not entirely dead. But he does say, if you look at Jonah, he says he went down to the, to the gates of Sheol, basically, and the cords wrapped around his head. And let's see, uh, yeah, Joel Amos. Okay. Sorry, take my second. What? Okay. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Um, he says, uh, "I called to the Lord out of my distress, and He answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried." So that sounds like death. Because Sheol is the place in the land of the deceased departed spirits in the Old Testament. And thou didst hear my voice. Now, it could be symbolic for the depths of the sea. Because Sheol, by the way, is under the earth. Do you know that? Interestingly enough, you know, if you take geology class like I do, oh, it's the crust of the earth, and under that, then you have magnesium, and then you have nickel, and iron. It's like, you don't know any of this. You don't know, well, I won't say that. <laughs> but they don't know any of this stuff. And you see all these cutouts of the earth and this, uh, the core and this is the circle and it's really hot and this is less hot and this. You don't know anything. You haven't been there. You haven't gone through the, quote, crust of the earth. Ah, these people. Is this not why they're wrong that they know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the Queen of Sheba, isn't it? Um, that came and uh, sought the uh, wisdom of Solomon. And she was like, whoa, you're even wiser than I thought you were. Even she's going to rise at the judgment and condemn those people. Because these are people that, that the Jews, the Sadducees, sorry, the Pharisees, thought were just terrible people. And we're the holy people. And Jesus is using them and saying, they're going to fare better at the judgment than you are. Well, there are, well, they'd be actually closer to the truth in that one because there are um, yeah. fountains of waters under the earth. Well, Amazing, they actually hit on something for once. You know, the thing that really gets me too is, 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 is space and galaxies. And, it, and Bill Morallo and I joke about this all the time. Whenever something comes up, it was like, NASA has discovered a new planet. It's, you know, uh, 14.643 billion light years away, and we now know that it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a planet very similar to Earth, could have, was formed 542.3 million years ago, and it has an atmosphere very similar to America, uh, I mean, to, to, to Earth, and, and could have sustained life, and I'm like, really? You got all that from a dot? That's all they can see is a dot. I went to the, to the um, uh, planetarium over there with the youth group some years ago in Coco, and, and they have this massive telescope that's bigger and taller than this room, okay? It's massive. And we all get to go and see the closest thing coming to us, and whatever it was, I forget it was, and the, the guy was so excited, oh, you're gonna be so great to see this. And we all got up there and looked at the little, little thing, and it's like, it's a dot. It's just like no more than you can see with your naked eye, almost. I mean, maybe you couldn't see the dot, but all you can see is a dot. Everything's a dot, basically. It's like people. They know neither scriptures nor the power of God. At any rate, so I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, says Jonah. Yet thou didst bring up my life from that pit. That's another word for Sheol or death. So he probably died fully. 
oh my God, although he might have been alive and mostly dead in the whale, but it, it could be symbolic just for how deep he was in the fathomless oceans in this belly of the beast of the, of the great fish. What fish it is, by the way, we don't know if it's a whale. Could have been a fish, uh, says, says great fish. And there are a lot of things that are no longer on the earth that are now, they're extinct. They're going extinct all the time. Could have been a, one of the great fish of, of yesteryear that is no longer around, or it might be one still around. And maybe one we don't know that's still around, it's in the depths that we're always finding stuff still. It obeyed him and down went Jonah and he came up three days later and Jesus says that was a resurrection. And he probably was in Sheol in the pit and came up out of it. Those bars opened up and up he comes and he's alive again and his body's alive again. And he goes and he preaches. And Jesus says, that's the sign, that's the only sign that will be given to this evil and adulterous generation that the Son of Man, this is the sign I'll give you. Bury me and three days later I'll, I'll get up again, just like Jonah. Wow. So... There's the Old Testament, once again, proclaiming Christ's resurrection. Did Paul speak on this when he preached in the synagogues? We don't know what he said. So we look at another one? All right, Matthew 17. This is fun, isn't it? Are you having fun? Okay. Huh? Good. Matthew 17, verse 1 and following. We're going to go 1 through maybe 9. Oh, yeah, this is a little different, but yeah, okay. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart, okay? So up on the mountain. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became dazzling white, or white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses over here and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's well that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three booths here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Remember, that was one of the uh, suffering servant songs. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. Probably fear is the word for beo in the Greek or I don't know, but it says awe here. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So what do we know here? Is that uh, another two people that are supposed to be dead are alive. So Moses and Elijah. So Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. That's actually a good trans, isn't it? For once. That's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to name Transfiguration Sunday next year. Tr Transfiguration visibility. <laughs> yeah, visibility day for Transfiguration. <laughs> Watch and see Jesus transformed into dazzling lights. <laughs> so but notice, once again, he's not God of dead people. He's God of living people. These people live to him. They're his saints. Moses is supposed to be dead, and he's alive. He's talking on the mountain with Jesus. Elijah's supposed to be dead. He's talking. In fact, he didn't even die. He just went up to heaven in a whirlwind, and he's talking in glory. Wow, was that even with his body? I don't know, because his body didn't die. Interesting. I don't know the answer to that question. But nevertheless, these are living people. There is life after, the, after death, and he's not the God of dead, but the, live, the living, and it's again speaking of resurrection. Uh, not only living after you die, but living at the last day when God raises all the dead, and that's, we're all waiting for that one. It's, yeah, but it's, it's referring to two men from the Old Testament, I would say, that, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's not necessarily using an Old Testament scripture, but it's using Old Testament people in the Old Testament scriptures to prove that one. That's all I have for Jesus' references to the resurrection. Now I have a whole bunch of ones from the apostles and others. We're getting close towards uh, 749. Hmm. 
I have a better idea. Any questions? Would you like an OCD statistic? Yeah. When you mentioned Sheba, I remembered I was okay. fascinated by her, uh, Queen Sheba, and I just figured it out again. She gave Solomon $321 million in today's dollars. Wow. Back then. Nice. Talent, 71 pounds to a talent based on Roman. That's almost enough to win uh, having your case heard in an appeal court. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm being too political today. No, no it's only 100, 155 to have that done. Sorry. But yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's a lot of money. $2,400 an ounce of gold. Wow. Wow. That is OCD. That's why you and I are brothers. <laughs> Very good. Very good. That's amazing. And what a story she had. Do we have any other questions? All right. What happens to you when you die? Are you, is he God of the dead or he, is he God of the living? Well, I'm not God of the dead, I'm of the living. Of course, he's the God of everything, but he's, he's uh, you know, you're going to live when you die. What happens when your body goes? Well, it's going to expire at some point. Good thing, by the way, we don't want to live in this one forever. As it is, anyway, right? Huh? Your warranty's running out? Yeah, it's like Stephen Wright, right? The comedian, he says, I know when I'm, when I'm going to die because my birth certificate has an expiration date on it. <laughs> but, you know, our bodies are going to wear out. But the good news is that's, I mean, we don't die. In fact, those who believe in Christ, though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Which means death can't sting you anymore. Its stinger has been removed, 1 Corinthians 15. It doesn't have any power over you anymore. Over such as are baptized and born again, over such the second death has no power. And so you live up with God in heaven when you die. To, do, to die is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better, says Paul. And again, to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5. And Stephen looked up when he was dying, and oh, I see the heavens rent open like a big planetarium. And there's God standing above the firmament, Jesus standing there to receive him. And, and he goes up and he receives him. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And so you're going to live and be with God in heaven, your body laid into the earth, only for a brief little time. And you know the word cemetery, I think, comes from cemetarium or something in the, in the Latin. I'd have to look it up exactly, but basically is a Latin word meaning a place where you tempor lay down and take a temporary rest, like a nap, and get up again. So that's what it's, it's, Christians are the ones that gave the word cemetery to cemeteries. It's just a place where you're temporarily taking a nap, temporarily taking a nap, from which you will shortly get up again. And that's the Christian's hope of the resurrection. Our bodies are going to rise from our graves. So, um, praise be to God for that. And we'll talk more about that uh, in two weeks. Next week.